come back tomorrow. Why? Because I said so, that's why. Well, what do I got to chase a chicken for? It's embarrassing, you know? First, because I said so. And second, because chicken chasing is how we always used to train in the old days. Yeah. You can't... <laughs> את ישראל, עמך, אהבת. I'm Rabbi Paul, your virtual rabbi. You have found Beit Virtuali, and let's stir up some Torah together. Starting by acknowledging that I am actually doing last week's parasha. This week is parasha Emor. I have been dealing with some funny and strange health issues. And so I think that last week was universal enough that I wanted to get it up on the channel. And if you want to hear what I have to say about Amor, you'll have to wait until next year, I guess. In the meantime, acknowledging that this is one week off, I still wanted to get this out there for Parshat Kedushin. And so with that in mind, with full respect to my parents who may be listening to this, the thing that drove me the craziest growing up was an arbitrary answer to a sincere question. But why do I need to do that? Because I told you so. Granted, it is more complicated than that, and there are plenty of reasons, both valid and less, that parents might answer with this non-answer and give as a reason the mere and pure existence of parental authority. Sometimes the question does not come from a place of curiosity. For example, rather a child is simply pushing boundaries. Sometimes there is no time to answer. There might be a danger. Safety first. Sometimes, and perhaps not as good of an answer, the parents do not actually have a good answer and so choose to say, because I said so. And sometimes, as I'm sure was often the case with me, that particular why was the 40th over the course of two minutes. Some of us do like to speak simply to hear ourselves speak. Nonetheless, when there is time to answer and the question is one of curiosity, my child self would like to speak through my adult voice and suggest that dialogue and discourse at these moments is good business, even if the answer is, I don't know, because the follow-up to that is great pedagogy, but let's find out together. Both parent and child in this constellation elevate each other. When we add into this mix our first introductions to religion, any aversion we might develop to hearing because I told you so can easily get layered over our experiences of religion or our concepts of deity. This is one of the reasons I insist on using the better translation, the Ten Utterances, rather than the worse translation, the Ten Commandments. Not only will I argue that the Dibrot in Hebrew does not mean commandments, but rather closer to words, which renders well into utterances. As well, I will point out that I am the eternal your God is not exactly a commandment. It's a statement, an utterance. And in the tradition of Rabbi Lawrence Kushner's treatment on the subject, neither is the whole coveting thing a commandment. You can't command someone's thoughts, no matter how much those with political utopian visions will argue that this should be done for the sake of bringing about a transformation into a state that human nature itself makes impossible. But I digress. Rabbi Kushner writes, Not only are all ten utterances at Sinai contained within the first word, Anochi, I, they are all of one piece, one organic unity. The first utterance, I am the eternal your God, contains the germ of all that is yet to follow, just as the final utterance, thou shalt not covet, is the fruition of all that has come before. As the first utterance begins with I, so the last commandment concludes with your neighbor. The first utterance in the last commandment may be joined to one another because they are simply sides of the same truth. They are the cause of the other. Something like this was suggested by Rabbi Mordechai of Zolotchev, who intuits that not to covet is not a commandment, but a reward. That's a far cry from wailing against the restrictions of religious systems or the misplaced hatred of horribly translated phrases like thou shalt not. Thou shalt not is what the scary bearded dude in the sky says to mortals that can be squished like bugs. The literal and direct translation of the Hebrew that is rendered thou shalt not is you no. And notice that doesn't translate very well directly, so we must interpret and you won't is a much better interpretation from the Hebrew and can indeed be a statement of command, but as well a statement of state, as in a state of being. If you have no other God before me, meaning if you recognize that we are all interconnected, then you won't even consider harming another. It will just be obvious by stepping into the gate of the first utterance. We are all part of the same oneness. And yet, we still get stuck insisting that the Torah must be understood in the absolute least sophisticated way. 
lo in Hebrew must mean thou shalt not, because that's the translation we most wish to dislike. Torah becomes a straw man. If we remove the commandments mentality from Torah and replace it with a discussion and ongoing dialogue regarding how we can best make this humanity thing work, then it's much harder to slam our ancient tome of wisdom shut and assume our own superiority because, um, we have better phones? Parshat Kedushin, the second part of this week's paired parshiot Achremot Kedushin, when read within the strict prejudices of our injured childhood egos, will tangle our adult selves in the mentality of thou shalt not, and more so in this case, because I told you so. More specifically for Kedushin, why? I'm the eternal your God. God. Over the course of chapter 19 of the book of Leviticus, also known as the Holiness Code, and also incidentally the exact center of Torah, we have of the 37 verses, a total of seven that end in Ani Adonai Elohechem, I'm the eternal, your God, eight that end in Ani Adonai, I'm the eternal, and an extra thrown in with the classic additional reason, Ani Adonai Elohechem, Asher Otseti Atchem Me'eretz Mitzrayim, I'm the eternal, your God, who brought you out of Egypt. And quite frankly, most of the verses that do not end in one of these seals are part of a string of ethical or moral considerations with the entire series then being capped off with one of these variations. There's quite a bit to unpack in Kedushin to try and figure out if a parental figure in heaven is giving us a because I said so type of answer as to why we should do what is spoken in this chapter or if there's something else being said. The chapter is indeed a mixture of ethical and moral considerations. In this case, ethical referring to more universal considerations of behavior and moral referring to ones more specific to time and place. Just as an aside, and it's an important aside, the easy way to internalize this difference is on the ethical side to consider the many variations of the so-called golden rule. The Jewish version reads that which is reprehensible do not do to another. Nearly every culture or religion has some variation of this, east and west, and is so universal that Immanuel Kant tried to formulate this into philosophy speak as the basis of his universal ethic, act only in accordance with that maxim through which you can at the same time will it to become universal law. In the Holiness Code, the universalizable elements include such items as not putting a stumbling block before the blind and paying laborers on time. Each of these can be universalized simply by visualizing how we would react if the forbidden behavior was done to us. We want to hold our employees paycheck to get an extra day of interest for our company. I'm sure we can find a clever way to justify this, which will work right up until the point that we need to pay a bill and our employer is holding back our pay for an extra day. We do make an art out of justifying our actions to ourselves and others, but the moment it cannot be universalized, it's unethical. Let's be blunt. It's wrong, universally, and it's wrong no matter how clever the justification. On the moral side of the equation, we have such items as not cutting the sides of our beard with a blade. There are great teachings in Judaism to explain how this is symbolic of other things which could lead us towards ethical behavior, but only the most fundamentalist among us is going to suggest all people everywhere should be forced to follow this statement because it is in the Torah. And yet within certain times and streams of Jewish culture, because this mitzvah appears in Torah, it would have been, and in some places still is, incorrect behavior to shave specific places. It's a rule limited to correct behavior within that group. Hence, this is a moral and not an ethical rule. I hope we can all agree that forcing a law in Myconesia for all to follow this moral tenet would be unethical. See how this works? Both today and yesterday, we should not treat others in a way that we would never wish to be treated. At the same time, most of us can easily imagine things that were considered generally wrong behavior in the past to now be unimaginable to ever call wrong. Ethics don't change, just our ability to look at our own behaviors clearly and the amount of gunk that society throws in our windshield to block our ability to think ethically. Morals change over time as societies seek to survive its current challenges. Sometimes these morals and ethics overlap. Many times they do not. Knowing if your moral actions or beliefs are forcing you into unethical places, it's a bit important. But unless we have good definitions, we can't even think of this stuff easily. So with that in mind, at least the details of Kiddushin will now make a little more sense. Without understanding this difference, it is a little hard to swallow that right next to the seat of all ethical thought, and love your neighbor as yourself, we have one verse after not mating different types of cattle together. From a non-generous lens, this is all an arbitrary jumble. 
from the lens of our tradition coming from a people trying to survive and figure out the contradictions between the universal ideal and the momentary necessity, the holiness code is a treasure trove. Still, what's with all this because I said so stuff? Well, Torah doesn't say because I said so. It's just really interesting that that's what we hear. The Torah says a variation of, I am the eternal your God, and perhaps more importantly, it's never there explicitly as a because to a why. Let's just look at one verse. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap all the way to the edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not pick your vineyard bare or gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I, the eternal, am your God. Ani Adonai Elohechem. Rather than reading with a prejudice that Torah is primitive and we are far more clever, I offer a different visualization. Imagine each of these ethical or moral tenets being placed on an individual sheet of paper. On that paper are the words, don't harvest to the ends of your fields. Now we fold up the paper, place it in an envelope, get all old-timey romantic, drip some wax on the enclosure of the envelope, and press a seal into the wax. When pressed, the seal reads, I am the eternal your God. Ani Adonai Elohechem. Notice in this perspective that there is no because I said so here, as there has not been a question asked. Still, this does not make sense if, and yes, this is a recording, we are stuck into visualizing the eternal as a being and the four-letter name of God as a name like Bob or Jane. Neither are explicitly the case in Jewish thought. Yes, this is a repetition of many of my drashot, but must be repeated until God is no longer at any instinctive level the bearded dude on the ceiling. The eternal is an English placeholder for the ineffable name of God made up of the Hebrew letters yud Hey vav and Hey, and form a variation of the verb to be in Hebrew. In Jewish thought, the eternal is not a limited deity, but the unknowable I of the universe. The best we can do with the limited language and comprehension to move us to the understanding that we are all part of a oneness. If we don't get there, our religious observance falls closer to following orders. Down drill, Sergeant! Go! Why did you put that weapon together so quickly, go? You tell me to, drill, Sergeant. Commandments, then is living a part of a dialogue. Utterances. And yes, that is easy to say. Every time I have ever uttered these words and pointed to the underlying ethical verses such as the stranger in your midst you shall love as yourself, for you were once strangers in Egypt, I see nods of understanding and feel understanding from within my own heart. Of course, don't do something to someone else regardless of if they are a member of the tribe or not that I wouldn't want done to me. Yay, all problems solved. Right up until the moment in the parking lot after the service that we then talk smack about someone behind their back. Oops, so not yay. So is it any surprise that a text attempting to formulate central and moral ethical principles would try to hammer home the true underlying reasons why we should pay a little more attention than a smug nod while listening to the sermon? There is no arbitrary because I'm the eternal your God at the end of each verse because Ani Adonai Elohechem does not mean I'm the eternal your God. That's our translation. It's the best we can do. But if God is not a being, it simply cannot mean that. It means instead something closer to the central perspective of the collective universe is that all is connected to the same existence. Retranslation now with this as a seal. You won't put a stumbling block before the blind. We are all interconnected. You won't hold the wages of the laborers overnight. We're all interconnected. Love your neighbor. We're all interconnected. Love the stranger. We're all interconnected. And you know this because you yourself has at some point been treated as a stranger. They're not reasons, they're seals, they're reminders. Perhaps it's merely accidental that these words with the seal that follow them are smack dab in the middle of Torah. If accidental, it's a cool accident. But that constant reminder of inner connectivity, rather than a silly arbitrary because I said so, also gives us an iterative question. This one doesn't get put off until once a year, however. This constant repetition of Ani Adonai is a hint for the ritual daily, practical, spiritual use of this utterance. When I'm about to call my subcontractor and tell them that they will get their paycheck at the end of the week instead of our handshake agreement first of the month, can I seal that deal with Ani Adonai? 
In other words, am I ready to invite the consciousness of oneness into that decision? The words of justification I use when I vote for something that if it ever came into my household or family, I would be forced to ignore. Am I able to place a seal of universality on this? Hey, those people are affected, not me. Let's make their life harder. It'll be for a good reason because my ideology is right, so it's okay to cause them to suffer a bit. And oh yeah, surely Torah didn't mean that kind of stranger. If I was under their control, they would never treat me well, so I have the full license to discriminate in any way I wish. Surely they don't count as being a part of a oneness. Listen, folks, I know in the year 2023, this is hard, but if we name a group, any group, no matter how hip it is to dunk on that group in the moment and justify treating them differently, then we are acting out of a place of unethical action. And no matter the justification, we're wrong, period. We must be because we would never want the same directed at us. We cannot put a stamp of Adonai Elohechem on that action. It is that clear and simple and still as clearly and simply ignored because our ideologies will always win out and cause us to enter the next cycle of who is it okay to go after today? The seal of interconnectivity is placed over and over on these tenets because this is the stuff that we intellectually acknowledge and do anyway. We require the constant reminder. The continuous restatement of the seal is the sad commentary that we give more energy to our justifications than our work to simply only act in the way that we can universalize. The Holiness Code sits at the very center, not only because it is the only answer that can be found in essentially every religion and philosophical tradition in one way or another, but as well because the second we think in this way, instead of through dogmas, instead of through ideologies, it is the one path through which we do begin the real process of healing this world. Shabbat Shalom. We'll see you next time. Adonai